To conclude these historical remarks, I would like to turn, as I have elsewhere, to Wilhelm von Humboldt, one of the most stimulating and intriguing thinkers of the period. Humboldt was, on the one hand, one of the most profound theorists of general linguistics, and on the other, an early and forceful advocate of libertarian values. The basic concept of his philosophy is Bildung, by which, as J. W. Burrow expresses it, he meant the fullest, richest, and most harmonious development of the potentialities of the individual, the community, or the human race. His own thought might serve as an exemplary case. Though he does not, to my knowledge, explicitly relate his ideas about language to his libertarian social thought, there is quite clearly a common ground from which they develop, a concept of human nature that inspires each. Mill's essay On Liberty takes as its epigraph Humboldt's formulation of the leading principle of his thought the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity. Humboldt concludes his critique of the authoritarian state by saying, I have felt myself animated throughout with a sense of the deepest respect for the inherent dignity of human nature and for freedom which alone befits that dignity. Briefly put, his concept of human nature is this. The true end of man, or that which is prescribed by the eternal and immutable dictates of reason, and not suggested by vague and transient desires, is the highest and most harmonious development of his powers to a complete and consistent whole. Freedom is the first and indispensable condition which the possibility of such a development presupposes, but there is besides another essential intimately connected with freedom, it is true, a variety of situations. Like Rousseau and Kant, he holds that nothing promotes this ripeness for freedom so much as freedom itself. This truth, perhaps, may not be acknowledged by those who have so often used this unripeness as an excuse for continuing repression. But it seems to me to follow unquestionably from the very nature of man. The incapacity for freedom can only arise from a want of moral and intellectual power. To heighten this power is the only way to supply this want, but to do this presupposes the exercise of the power, and this exercise presupposes the freedom which awakens spontaneous activity. Only it is clear we cannot call it giving freedom, when bonds are relaxed which are not felt as such by him who wears them. But of no man on earth, however neglected by nature and however degraded by circumstances, is this true of all the bonds which oppress him. Let us undo them one by one, as the feeling of freedom awakens in men's hearts, and we shall hasten progress at every step. Those who do not comprehend this may justly be suspected of misunderstanding human nature and of wishing to make men into machines. Man is fundamentally a creative, searching, self-perfecting being. To inquire and to create, these are the centers around which all human pursuits more or less directly revolve. But freedom of thought and enlightenment are not only for the elite. Once again, echoing Rousseau, Humboldt states, there is something degrading to human nature in the idea of refusing to any man the right to be a man. He is, then, optimistic about the effects on all of the diffusion of scientific knowledge by freedom and enlightenment. But all moral culture springs solely and immediately from the inner life of the soul and can only be stimulated in human nature and never produced by external and artificial contrivances. The cultivation of the understanding, as of any of man's other faculties, is generally achieved by his own activity, his own ingenuity, or his own methods of using the discoveries of others. Education, then, must provide the opportunities for self-fulfillment. It can, at best, provide a rich and challenging environment for the individual to explore in his own way. 
Even a language cannot, strictly speaking, be taught, but only awakened in the mind. One can only provide the thread along which it will develop of itself. I think that Humboldt would have found congenial much of Dewey's thinking about education, and he might also have appreciated the recent revolutionary extension of such ideas, for example, by the radical Catholics of Latin America who are concerned with the awakening of consciousness, referring to the transformation of the passive, exploited lower classes into conscious and critical masters of their own destinies. He would, I am sure, have approved of their criticism of schools that are more preoccupied with the transmission of knowledge than with the creation, among other values, of a critical spirit. From the social point of view, the educational systems are oriented to maintaining the existing social and economic structures instead of transforming them. But Humboldt's concern for spontaneity goes well beyond educational practice in the narrow sense. It touches also the question of labor and exploitation. The remarks just quoted about the cultivation of understanding through spontaneous action continue as follows. Man never regards what he possesses as so much his own as what he does, and the laborer who tends a garden is perhaps in a truer sense its owner than the listless voluptuary who enjoys its fruits. In view of this consideration, it seems as if all peasants and craftsmen might be elevated into artists, that is, men who love their labor for its own sake, improve it by their own plastic genius and inventive skill, and thereby cultivate their intellect, ennoble their character, and exalt and refine their pleasures. And so humanity would be ennobled by the very things which now, though beautiful in themselves, so often serve to degrade it. But still, freedom is undoubtedly the indispensable condition, without which even the pursuits most congenial to individual human nature can never succeed in producing such salutary influences. Whatever does not spring from a man's free choice, or is only the result of instruction and guidance, does not enter into his very being, but remains alien to his true nature. He does not perform it with truly human energies, but merely with mechanical exactness. If a man acts in a purely mechanical way, reacting to external demands or instruction rather than in ways determined by his own interests and energies and power, we may admire what he does, but we despise what he is. On such conceptions, Humboldt grounds his ideas concerning the role of the state, which tends to make man an instrument to serve its arbitrary ends, overlooking his individual purposes. His doctrine is classical liberal, strongly opposed to all but the most minimal forms of state intervention in personal or social life. Writing in the 1790s, Humboldt had no conception of the forms that industrial capitalism would take. Hence, he is not overly concerned with the dangers of private power. But when we reflect, still keeping theory distinct from practice, that the influence of a private person is liable to diminution and decay, from competition, dissipation of fortune, even death, and that clearly none of these contingencies can be applied to the state, we are still left with a principle that the latter is not to meddle in anything which does not refer exclusively to security. He speaks of the essential equality of the condition of private citizens, and of course has no idea of the ways in which the notion private person would come to be reinterpreted in the era of corporate capitalism. He did not foresee that Democracy, with its motto of equality of all citizens before the law, and liberalism, with its right of man over his own person, both would be wrecked on realities of capitalist economy. He did not foresee that in a predatory capitalist economy, state intervention would be an absolute necessity to preserve human existence and to prevent the destruction of the physical environment. I speak optimistically. As Karl Polanyi, for one, has pointed out, 
the self-adjusting market, could not exist for any length of time without annihilating the human and natural substance of society. It would have physically destroyed man and transformed his surroundings into a wilderness. Humboldt did not foresee the consequences of the commodity character of labor. The doctrine, in Polanyi's words, that it is not for the commodity to decide where it should be offered for sale, to what purpose it should be used, at what price it should be allowed to change hands, and in what manner it should be consumed or destroyed. But the commodity in this case is a human life, and social protection was therefore a minimal necessity to constrain the irrational and destructive workings of the classical free market. Nor did Humboldt understand that capitalist economic relations perpetuated a form of bondage which, as early as 1767, Simon Languet had declared to be even worse than slavery. It is the impossibility of living by any other means that compels our farm laborers to till the soil whose fruits they will not eat, and our masons to construct buildings in which they will not live. It is want that drags them to those markets where they await masters who will do them the kindness of buying them. It is want that compels them to go down on their knees to the rich man in order to get from him permission to enrich him. What effective gain has the suppression of slavery brought him? He is free, you say. Ah, that is his misfortune. The slave was precious to his master because of the money he had cost him. But the handicraftsman costs nothing to the rich voluptuary who employs him. These men, it is said, have no master. They have one, and the most terrible, the most imperious of masters. That is need. It is this that reduces them to the most cruel dependence. If there is something degrading to human nature in the idea of bondage, then a new emancipation must be awaited, Fourier's third and last emancipatory phase of history which will transform the proletariat to free men by eliminating the commodity character of labor, ending wage slavery, and bringing the commercial, industrial, and financial institutions under democratic control. Perhaps Humboldt might have accepted these conclusions. He does agree that state intervention in social life is legitimate if freedom would destroy the very conditions without which not only freedom— but even existence itself would be inconceivable, precisely the circumstances that arise in an unconstrained capitalist economy. In any event, his criticism of bureaucracy and the autocratic state stands as an eloquent forewarning of some of the most dismal aspects of modern history, and the basis of his critique is applicable to a broader range of coercive institutions than he imagined. Though expressing a classical liberal doctrine, Humboldt is no primitive individualist in the style of Rousseau. Rousseau extols the savage who lives within himself. He has little use for the sociable man, always outside of himself, who knows how to live only in the opinion of others, from whose judgment alone he draws the sentiment of his own existence. Humboldt's vision is quite different. The whole tenor of the ideas and arguments unfolded in this essay might fairly be reduced to this, that while they would break all fetters in human society, they would attempt to find as many new social bonds as possible. The isolated man is no more able to develop than the one who is fettered. Thus he looks forward to a community of free association without coercion by the state or other authoritarian institutions, in which free men can create and inquire and achieve the highest development of their powers, far ahead of his time he presents an anarchist vision that is appropriate, perhaps, to the next stage of industrial society.